over to you, James. Thank you, Chair. And uh, good morning, Anna, and thank you for joining us today. I know you initially trained as a doctor and sadly uh, are unable to practice as a doctor. Um, I'm sure that gives you an insight into the situation you've faced as, as your condition uh, has developed. Um, I wondered, first of all, as a working age person, how you feel the social care system has treated you so far? Good morning and thank you for inviting me to speak to you today. Um, I think before I talk about the social care system from a funding perspective, I just wanted to um, comment on the integration that we've just heard about between health and social care. So as someone that uses um, quite a lot of health and social care in my life what I really need is for them to be working together towards one common goal and that that goal is set by me that I can get on as best as possible with my life and so to be honest the structure and the system that they do that in doesn't really matter for me what matters is the outcome and people's lives um, I think big is not necessarily always better I know people talk about bringing social care into the NHS or joining them um, health is big at the moment and I think at one point I had seven consultants, GP, physio, wheelchair services and they're not talking to each other so I don't necessarily think that we need one big structure but that actually all those people need to be working around the person towards that common goal so that was just my thought on integration as someone that uses a lot of health and social care um, but for me um, a 34 year old who um, has found myself needing social care for about the last eight years. Um, I'm really grateful for the care I receive. It keeps me fed, it keeps me clean, it keeps me watered. Um, but I really feel I'm not able to be living a normal life. Um, I don't have enough hours to be able to go out at the weekends and the evenings and just do a lot of the normal things that make life worth living for us. And my life kind of got split up into chunks. So um, how long would it take me to have a shower? How long do I need to get dressed? How long for food preparation? And that's not really about what I want my life to be. Um, and I found myself in the position quite regularly where I have to think, well, I've only got two hours left this week. Do I want to do food shopping? Do I want to have another shower? Or do I want to go and meet up with a friend? And, and that's quite a hard place to have to live your life um, where you're having to quantify the things you want to do into a small number of hours a week. Another aspect, I think, around the funding of social care that a lot of us feel who use social care is the fear of cuts, of our hours being cut. So um, I, I actually tweeted last year when I got the letter about my review being due about that sense of fear. that It makes me feel sick to think that my review is coming up because it's so out of my control and that those hours could be cut. And so many people got in touch and said they felt the same. And it's... Um, such a scary time for us when we're under review and I know so many people that have had their hours cut often by up to a third just like that and that's a third less life that that person could effectively be getting on with and living um, I use direct payments so I receive a direct payment from the local authority and I employ my own PAs which is great it means I get choice over who comes in and out of my house and who I employ um, but I do think that the amount of money we get um, is quite low so it means it's a low wage job which makes recruitment and retention quite difficult of PAs. And I know that's a problem across the whole system. Um, direct payments are a fantastic thing. They were brought in to give people like me, people of any age, um, choice and control over their care. And I think as the money has got tighter in the system, the system and the local authorities have tried to kind of claw back a bit of control. So direct payments have lost some of that sense of flexibility. And there's an awful lot of scrutiny now over how we use our money, a lot of rules and um, things that we can't spend money on. Um, and it certainly doesn't feel like that direct payments is giving us that choice and control that it was designed to. And there's quite a big power imbalance, I think, at the moment. So and a lot of fear. So, for example, I get letters quite regularly in bold. It says if you do not return this form in 14 days, your direct payment may be stopped. And it's, it's that kind of relationship with the local authority rather than one of trust and working together to enable people to be getting on with our lives. Mm -hmm. um, from funding, financial contributions is a big thing for me. I think if I received continuing health care or personal health budget via NHS funding, I wouldn't have to pay contributions, but I received direct payments. So I am assessed uh, through a very complicated system that I do not understand and means assessment. Um, 
uh, to for my contribution. And there is no currently no lifetime cap. So um, I started needing care in my 20s. I may need it to my 60s, 80s, who knows? And compared to my peers of my age who don't need care, through no fault of my own needing social care, I will have spent quite a lot of money on social care. And so I'm at a financial disadvantage. And it's a disincentive for me to save because if I ever reach uh, £14,000 of savings, those would start to be taken towards my care. And at £23,000, I'd be a self-funder. So I think for working age adults, that is quite an issue. But the final point I wanted to talk about is what are we funding for? So if we're trying to increase funding for more of the same, then I think we'd be failing social care. Um, things like care homes, you know, I never, I've never met anybody in their 50s, 60s, 70s who says to me, oh, I hope when I get a bit older and frail and my family put me in a care home. I meet people all the time that say, oh, don't let them send me to a home. And we shouldn't have a system that people fear having to need in their older age. And then people my age talk about it being a fight, fighting the system. And, and that constant sort of sense that we are having to fight for our rights and fight to have a life. And so if we believe, which I hope we do, that disabled people, older people, people with learning disabilities deserve an ordinary and a good life like everyone else, then to be part of the community, live in our own homes, be able to contribute to society because we have a lot to offer, then I think we need to be funding a system that truly allows that, not just more of the same. Thank you. That's really helpful. Thank you. And you've covered so many areas there. But what strikes me is, is that you feel that the indep independent person you want to be is limited to some extent in, in, in that you, uh, you and presumably feel that with more support, you could be doing more in with life. And I, I wonder what kind of proportion of life you feel you live to the full. Uh, uh, so what gap is there in the provision you receive? Um, wow, it's, it's quite large, I would say. Um, I get, I wrote it down, 31 hours a week of social care of which uh, 20 of that is um, for things like personal care, uh, food preparation, the sort of things that I think are um, keeping me fed, clean and watered. And then there's, so there's 12 hours, I think, or just under 12 hours, that's what's called social inclusion, um, which effectively is the bit that would be for me to be able to go out and, because um, I live by myself. Um, so, you know, I need support to be able to get about and things. And, as a someone in my thirties, that's not a lot of time. So if in the evening I think, oh, I'd like to just be able to go and meet up with someone, so, you know, those kind of that spontaneity is completely not there. I have to plan well, well, well ahead, um, even down to what time I'm going to go food shopping because I need to know I've got a PA that can come with me. Um, I think uh, it's had a big impact on my sense of self. And I spend an awful lot of time at home by myself, quite lonely in a sense and quite fed up, to be honest. Mm. <laughs> yeah. So if you were to change things, am I right in thinking that fundamentally you would introduce more trust in the system, in those receiving the care, in, in modelling the support they receive? Yeah, I think um, I would I would like it to be that the conversation starts from a different place. So people when they're assessed or reviewed or whatever that it's about actually what matters to you in your life what do you want your life to look like and then how can social care enable that rather than starting with sort of breaking me down into lots of little tasks but I do think trust is important I think I would like it to be that I feel I work with my social care um with social care as equal partners um that we have an open conversation that they they trust me to use the money in the way that's best going to meet my needs rather than it feeling like I'm constantly having to justify and battle to get just the basics that I'm getting now. Yeah, it's really helpful. Thank you very much. Thank you, Chair. Thank you very much. Very um, thoughtful 